Welcome to the Dowie Expert Series podcast. I'm Robert Coons. I am very pleased today to introduce uh, Mimi Guo Diemer. Hello, Mimi. Hi, Robbie. And it's so nice to hear someone pronounce my surname correctly. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So you are a luminary in our Qigong community, and you're doing a lot of cool things. Um, I became aware of you about two years ago. Um, as a result of seeing some of your social media postings. And um, if I understand well, you've been offering instruction in, in Qigong and related arts for a long time now, but you have a very, very big background as well um, within multiple other types of energetic and physical and, and spiritual practices. And so I thought it would be really cool to bring you on the show because you're the first Qigong expert that we've talked to. So welcome to the Dawi Experts podcast. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And I would not think of myself as an expert, but it's very kind of you to introduce me uh, with so many kind of positive accolades. Um, yeah, thank you for having me on the show. Great. So um, I'd like to ask for you to introduce a little bit about yourself and your background, who you are, what you teach, um, and uh, basically what's up with me. What is up with Mimi? Well, I am, I, I think I would broadly define my, uh, myself as someone loving trees. Uh, I love being out in sort of green space. Uh, I live in a natural um, area that's surrounded by footpaths and rivers and uh, a lot of spacious land. Um, it wasn't always like that. I used to live in London and before that in Beijing and before that in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, but I, I grew up in the U.S. and so I'm Chinese American. Uh, but I, I lived for a long time in China and my parents have always had a really strong connection to China, which actually was kind of, kind of rare for um, people of my age, just that uh, my parents actively encouraged us and brought us back to China as early as 1981. And uh, they had had a long-term relationship from the mid seventies onwards with China. Uh, I now live in England. And um, as you mentioned, I've been teaching Qigong. I've been teaching uh, meditation. The last few years, I've started dipping my toes into sharing what my Shifu uh, has been generously sharing with me, which is a lineage of uh, Liu Feng Chun's Ba Gua Zhang uh, and Xing Yi Quan, which is another internal martial art. I've been learning Tai Chi from an amazing teacher named Huang Ping in, in London. Uh, she was an, uh, a very accomplished Tai Chi master, Ba Gua master in China. Uh, she now lives in London. And um, prior to that, I taught a lot of yoga and pretty much almost from the time I began teaching yoga, I began teaching Qigong. And that was almost, gosh, that was over 20 years ago. So um, I've written a couple of books on Qigong and self-cultivation. And basically, I, I like to think of the things that I um, do in my own practice, uh, whether that be meditation, energy work, um, movement, uh, martial arts, uh, and the teaching that I do, I really like to think of them as offerings. Um, I try as often as I can to offer things donation-based uh, so that it, it creates a reciprocal relationship of um, what I can do to support others who might benefit from the practices uh, that I have really found beneficial to myself. And then in whatever capacity they're able to support me, uh, I, I, I welcome that. Um, but yeah, that's, I don't know. What else can I say? I've got three brothers, a dog, three cats, six chick, no, eight chickens. We used to have 60,000 bees, but the colony collapsed over the winter. Um, yeah, <laughs> maybe that's a good, a good place to start. And then, uh, I'll hand it back over to you. That's awesome. Oh, I'm so, I'm so happy about the cats. I, I'm covered in <laughs> covered in cats too we have a cat whose body is hot and a cat whose body is a little cooler um anyway sorry chinese medicine stuff just jumping out um so <laughs> i wanted but now you've given me some stuff to be nerdy about we have a lot of people in the audience who are interested in bagua and mm. 
Niu Niu Feng Chun, right? Is the Liu? Yeah. Oh, Liu or Niu? Yeah, Liu. Oh, so okay. Yeah, Liu Feng Chun, and my my 师傅是 Liu 呃 Liu Xu Yang. So what's the what, what's the origin of that lineage? I I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with it. It is so unknown. <laughs> it is. It's really fascinating because、um, he Liu Feng Chun was.、Uh, He only had one teacher, who was Dong Dong Haiquan. Unlike a lot of the other teachers、uh, who studied with Dong Haiquan, who had Taiji or Shaolin as a background,、um, Liu Fengchun had just Dong Haiquan as his、um, influence. And he is often described as、uh, having a practice that is the simplest, and of course. They would then describe it as the deadliest, <laughs> but who knows? I, I, you know, nothing is the est.、Uh, everything is valid, in my opinion.、Um, and、uh, but what what ended up being as a transmission down sort of each generation is is quite a distillation of practice. And、um, because I think he himself was quite humble, and he didn't have this the same aristocratic background. Uh, that some of the other、uh, lineage holders in in Bagua have, like he didn't spin off into、um, Yijing and、uh, relate, you know, palm changes and、um, things to all of the different trigrams so much as just emphasize the importance of of eight palm changes in a circle walk.、Uh, and Maestro says, you know, to walk one circle. Uh, correctly is the most difficult thing you can do, and I, I kind of feel it's true. <laughs>、um, so, yeah, I'm the I'm the sixth generation in the in this lineage, and、um, my shifu lives in Beijing. And miraculously, we've been learning together. I've been studying with him by Zoom since the pandemic, and I met before the pandemic.、Um, and I met him because I just wanted to learn some qigong, and I'd heard a lot about him. Uh, from two other friends who have studied with him, and they've always encouraged. One particular had encouraged me to to really study with him. And he said, "You will have your mind blown, Mimi. I really recommend if you've got time in Beijing to go and study with him." So I did, and I just wanted to learn some qigong. But then he ended up teaching me, you know, Xing Yi Quan and some Ba Gua. I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> and it completely changed the trajectory of. My life and my practice. So, yes, I love it. That is that is so cool. Number one, it's a cool story. Number two, it's a very interesting, different style of bagua that most people haven't seen before. So, you're you're bringing us treasures, Mimi.、Um, we'll but, see. <laughs> but beyond that, also, then this gives me another interesting jump off point, which is. Your family and you were in China in in eighty one, which is, if I'm right, that's right around the time that Dung opened things up. So,、yeah. you like, you know, to some extent, you grew up in in China, and、um, but you were born outside. And so during that time, which was a very interesting and very tumultuous time, do you have any impressions of growing up during that period and sort of what it was like? Most of us got to China a bit later. <laughs> yeah. Well, just to, to clarify,、uh, we went to China to visit for summer in 1981, and I was nine years, eight years old.、Uh, but after that initial visit, my grandmother、uh, really wanted. She was living with us in the U.S., and she really wanted to go back to China. So my father found her a courtyard house in Xisi, which is an old part just west of the Forbidden City in Beijing, and. Miraculously, that house is still there, and it was not demolished in the crazy kind of transforming,、uh, transform, transforming of, of Beijing over the last thirty, forty years. So、um, after 1984, my grandmother moved back there, and we had a base. And I went in 84.、Uh, I'm sorry, 81, 86, 88. And ninety every summer, and then ninety two. I was there for six months. Ninety four. I moved there. That was when I finished university, and lived there for thirteen years on and off until two thousand and nine. So、um, I did get to see China go undergo an incredible transformation, like a 
you know, my, my brother Kaiser um, runs a podcast called Seneca, and uh, he once referred to the, the change of um, Chinese kind of mentality, uh, not just as a hardware update, but as a total software update. Like, you know, it, it's just completely, um, not just a software update, a hardware update, like everything changed. Um, and I, I feel very fortunate to have had this opportunity to almost be in China at a time when there was a, a real sense of openness and curiosity and engagement with uh, anyone from the outside. And expats living in China at that time were a bit quirky. Um, and <laughs> lots of journalists and diplomats and China lovers and Chinese language lovers, uh, or just foreign students that were somehow attracted to going there. Um, but there was a lot of mingling with, uh, you know, Chinese at that time as well. So there wasn't this kind of separation between foreigners and non-foreigners so much. Um, but it, it really did shape a lot of who I am. So I'm, I'm very grateful to my parents because they really encouraged this interest and this respect for, um, you know, China as a country and a culture uh, and, I, I struggled, I have to say, as a, I worked as a journalist there, as a photographer, and also my first job there was with um, CNN, which is crazy. Uh, but that was at the time when there were only five people in the bureau, and that included the dog. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's now like, I don't, I don't know what it was, and if the bureau is still there anymore in Beijing. But um, I struggled as a journalist to, to kind of uh, appreciate a lot about China. And what's fascinating to me now is that since not being a journalist in China and having a relationship with my shifu, uh, I have this um, touchstone that's very different um, and a real deep appreciation for the aspects of Chinese um, uh, change and culture that are a, con a continuity and a narrative that doesn't, doesn't, that is still um, in some ways unchanged. Uh, and, and that's really a gift to me. Like my shifu basically is out at the park every morning. And I know that because I've seen him there and he's always there and no one else is ever there. And it's like, shifu, where is everybody else? Like, why are you the only one out there practicing? He's like, ah, they're Like, oh, they're just busy making money. Like my shifu is, you know, he's, he's very, very Taoist. Like he just, he lives this kind of anachronistic life. Like he just, he's a bone setter as well. So he has the, the branch of Chinese medicine really supporting his, his art. And he works as a bone setter. Um, and he also has just a, a small handful of students who are very um, just normal people. And, you know, he loves his art. He, he does it every day. He doesn't, um, you know, he always says, you, you don't practice uh, to be seen, you practice to see yourself. And, and you know, he's, he's very, he's, yeah, he's a huge inspiration, but really something that connects me to um, a place that it ha has been fraught, I'd have to say, because my experience of being young and in China during the 90s and 80s was, uh, challenging you know but also a gift um so it's kind of a comp complex and multi-layered uh response i suppose but no that's great i and i was happy to hear all of all of those different things especially the idea of connection because what i have said frequently to people who are planning to go to china to study these arts that we do mm -hmm. um there it, you won't see it unless there's a reason for you to see it yeah, that happens through connection, and everything happens. That's good. Everything kind of happens in private, even if you see it in public. Um, and so, having said that, there's another type of connection, which is um, predestination, right? You and Fen. Yes, and I think yeah. <laughs> you have very strong predestination with these arts. So, I'm wondering maybe if you could tell our viewers a little bit about your trajectory and mm. how you came to these arts and and what brought you here. 
that's such a great lead lead in because my shifu um, was once asked by one of my students, like, there's so many forms of qigong out there. How do you know which one to begin with and what to study? It's like yuan fin, right? destiny. It's it's just meant to be. And and um, I feel like the trajectory of my uh, embrace of energy arts and Chinese arts has been, you know, very much just serendipitous. Um, not very planned. <laughs> and uh, as I mentioned, I, I started off with yoga, um, but my first, uh, um, my very, very first exposure to practicing something like the energy arts was in 1988 with my brother. And we were on this Cradle of China tour for overseas Chinese. And they took us to the Shaolin temple, of course. And we studied for a few days with a monk and um, we learned Qigong and some martial arts and I loved it. And at the time I, I had studied some dance, but it was just a little taste. And it was much later that um, I, I, I moved more into movement through uh, sickness. And I was, I was feeling very burnt out working as a photographer in China. Uh, I was getting very physically sick and unwell. And my, my mother, um, she never did Qigong or martial arts. My grandmother did. And my grandmother did Tai Chi sword. Uh, she, she did a lot of martial arts her whole life. But my mother never took that up. She did take up yoga. And so she gave me a book and I started doing some movements and asanas from that. And it started to reverse my health. Uh, and that kind of led me into exploring yoga for a number of years. But um, when I really started getting invested more into the practice, I met someone who was a martial artist and a yoga teacher named Matthew Cohen. And he was teaching in Los Angeles at the time. He, he's now Shifu Matthew Cohen. Um, and he introduced me to this fusion of yoga and Qigong, but it was particularly Qigong that, that really caught my attention. I mean, he introduced standing and wuji to me and I'd never felt anything like that before. And I felt so grounded, but my hands were huge. And I just felt everything uh, was, was like a, a, a beautiful campfire warmth in my body and really spacious. Uh, and I was hooked and I just, well, what was that? Um, and I, continued kind of learning a little bit from him. I then met uh, an acupuncturist who was from New Zealand, uh, but she introduced the five elements and five phase theories, the wuxing, and she uh, came to teach a retreat at this yoga studio um, that I was running at the time in Beijing. We took the retreat to the mountains near the Great Wall. And, um, you know, it's, it's a place, a village where time has been slow to change. Like the, the first time I went to this village, which was in 2000, or late 2000, early 2001, uh, you know, there were still a few women with bound feet. Um, so we took them to this village. She un unfolded this incredible way of seeing uh, reality. Like, and what I, what I started to understand was that the Chinese understanding of energy and of health and of, um, you know, uh, uh, movement and our place in it is all empirically based. And, and that really appealed to me, um, which is a little bit different than the yoga tradition. Everything was just observation. And the science of that observation tested and tried through thousands of years and medicine and whether that be acupuncture or herbs or movement, um, just had this uh, uh, you know, beautiful confidence and weight for me. Um, and it felt very much like, oh, this is a, com a coming home. Uh, so I began doing Qigong daily and that was like 2003. Um, and it quickly reversed a lot of other health conditions that I had. And Yoga had supported me emotionally and mentally and physically for sure, but not in the same way that the Qigong was um, uh, revealing. And I, I just, yeah, I just knew it was, it was something that was very uh, 
uh, very much a love, <laughs> you know, very much came alive in my heart. And I never had formal teachers though. I, I, I'm very much like a self studier. Um, and even in yoga, you know, I only really have two teachers ever uh, in the 20 some years that I really think of as teachers. And I'd been looking for a Qigong teacher. Matthew was definitely a teacher to me. Cameron was a teacher. Um, but, but I just started getting more and more interested in five elements and wuxing, five phases. And then um, I decided when I moved to London to, uh, I was having some questions around yoga and what it was that I was teaching. And I decided to do a master's at a University of London um, department called SOAS. It used to be School of Oriental and African Studies until that was no longer politically correct. And so they just changed the name and still just made it so as. Um, but it was a, a degree in traditions of yoga and meditation and it covered yoga, Buddhism and Taoism. And I was like, ah, oh, this is like the ideal master's program for me. And the um, interesting thing that resulted from the three years that I did the course is that I fell out of love with yoga once I understood its origins and um, developments. And when I understood the origins and developments of Buddhism and Taoism, I fell completely in love. Uh, and Buddhism and Taoism just began, began to flourish in, in, in my um, interests and in my practice and in what I was sharing and what I studied. Um, in particular, but yeah, so the Qigong just, um, it, it took on this form, I suppose, of how does, how does this energy practice help me understand nature, understand the world, uh, and embody those principles? And it began making a lot of sense, just the way that Qigong um, as a form of medicine is a form of, of uh, meditation and spiritual practice, and then martial practice, which I, I didn't have the, the connection to until I met my Shifu, but how um, as a martial, medical, and spiritual practice, it, it is a way to uh, really find one's place in nature, you know, as part of nature, as the fabric and landscape arising in nature, um, and how, that, how we can be included in that. Uh, and be part of that and humble ourselves to it. Um, and I think some of the things that really um, are appealing to me about the trajectory of this is that as I've learned about Qigong and as my own practice of it has deepened and as I've learned more about Taoism and my, my appreciation of Taoism and Buddhism, which have a lot of commonality for me, um, as they've enriched, I've really... Uh, understood more through an embodied sense, these ideas of um, effort without struggle and strife, wu wei, of uh, spontaneity, zi ran, naturalism, uh, or seeing oneself, and of humility, um, of compassion, of uh, a, you know, a, a sense of simplicity and, and of living with simplicity. Um, and these are just, they, they're, they're really, um, beautifully, like you conceptually enticing, but more and more they're, they're arising as just an embodied knowing, uh, which I, I find really um, ironically beyond words, <laughs> but it's just, yeah. And, 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 in a lot of the Taoist traditions, as you know, from studying with the texts, right? That's the orientation is, you know, the space beyond the conceptual and, and beyond language. Excellent, right on. I, I really was pleased to hear about all of that. It, it's very interesting to me um, because I've had to also somewhat of a, a, a similar sort of unfolding of that, um, passion for for these different philosophies and schools of thought and I think that a lot of the things that you said resonated not only with myself but doubtless with many many of the people in the audience as well but from that I have two big questions that are kind of nestled together as one question and it's uh it may be a bit of a spicy question so you know I 
I, uh, I leave it to your discretion. But the first thing I want to ask is, what's the difference between Qigong and yoga? And then the second thing is, there's a trend these days of combining Qigong and yoga together. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that and, and say what you think about it. And, you know, from, from your perspective as a person with expertise in teaching both arts. Mm. Yeah. Um, so the, the first question of the differences between them, the, the, there are quite a lot of differences that I find uh, useful. Um, for example, in yoga, you have this word, Sankalpa, which is usually defined as, as uh, intention. Um, but intention is more like this heartfelt uh, desire to do something and it guides you. And it, um, it might be, you know, I practice, my Sankalpa is to know ease or I am ease. And it's often used as this affirmation or I, I practice so that I can feel um, uh uh, the unity and oneness of things, or something like that. Um, but in in, yo in 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 yoga, you don't use uh, intention in the same way that you would in qigong. And in qigong, I often think of qigong as an energy and intention based practice, um, where intention is directly relating to how we direct the energy as it's related to our environment. For example, you know, um, you're moving your hand and, and in yoga, it's like, okay, I'm moving my hand so that I feel spaciousness in the joints or something like that. Or um, I'm, you know, using intention to externally, internally rotate something or externally rotate something or the placement and the specificity of, of a form. But in Qigong, it's like, you, know, you could use the same movement, but add a different intention to it, which would be move your hands through cloud right? or move your hands through mud. You know, two very different feelings, but the same movement. Um, you know, in downward dog, you don't really talk. Of, you know, some people could, but they don't really talk about um, being the dog. <laughs> uh, whereas, you know, if you do a crane form, you really feel yourself as the crane and you embody the, the characteristics and qualities of, you know, harmony and longevity and grace and elegance and quickness and, uh, you know, these, these other characteristics. Um, yoga also, I would say on the whole, it tends to be physically a bit more linear and focusing on the extension outwards of the spine or along the spine or uh, into space from the spine. Uh, and that the shapes are quite sort of linear in that there's straight arms and straight legs, maybe with soft micro bends in, in the joints. Um, but in Qigong, you have much more of a, a round, uh, circular, spherical design um, to the movements and the movements themselves tend to be fairly straightforward and, and, and uncomplicated. Whereas yoga, they can get quite complicated with, you know, arms and legs and all kinds of different positions. The, the simplicity of the forms of Qigong can be for some people very unappealing. <laughs> they can find it quite boring. I've heard that, that description before. Um, but you know, attention is a funny thing. So, you know, the sheer magic of, of the felt experience for me is never boring. Um, and the repetition of a form that's seemingly simple and the, the kind of basic structures, nothing complicated, but the repetition of it, and then the sensing into the subtle energy and the movement of it um, can be either subtly interesting or quite startlingly profound. And, you know, I've, from my personal experience, like, wow, nine repetitions of this, and I'm feeling uh, a lot of energy and heat and release and my mind is all, all of a sudden not so busy and my, my breathing has changed. And yeah, it, it's just a very different subtle quality. Um, and from, from my, this is, again, this is only my view. Um, I, for a long time, would integrate yoga and qigong forms into fun, creative sequences. 
I found it quite amusing and entertaining and informative for myself and others. Um, from kind of a just a, a philosophical perspective, I find the reason and the um, attraction for both yoga and Taoism is an expansion of uh, consciousness and a freedom from orthodoxy. So I'm sure there are people in the yoga police academy and in the Qigong police academy who would be like, no, what you're doing is illegal. <laughs> you know, don't combine them. Um, but uh, I, I think um, so long as, and this is really important, right? so long as there is a, uh, an understanding and a, a deep respect for the differences um, of both traditions, uh, that there's no appropriation of Qigong and just dragging it into yoga asana because it's fun. Um, but there's this appreciation for uh, what contributions Qigong might have to the forms of, of asana, uh, what, what complementary uh, levels of uh, engagement or awareness or intentionality it might bring. As long as that's there, I think, great, you know, free yourself from the orthodoxies and, and you know, create. Uh, I mean, the Chinese lifted Buddhism, <laughs> you know, it took them 700 years to translate all of the texts from Sanskrit into, um, into Chinese, but, you know, it met with Taoism right, as a, an already existing practice of deep uh, meditation and, and spirituality. Um, and in, in the transmission of Buddhism into China, you know, there was a, a lot of mixing and it, it became Chan, which is very different than Theravada or Mahayana. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my take on it. I, I say go for it as long as you hold mutual respect for both approaches and understand what it is that bringing these together is, is, is um, benefiting and, and um, creating for students and for oneself. One of the undercurrents I'm hearing is that there are uh, discrete philosophies that inform different types of practices, and that when you do bring them together, if you if you choose to do that, or if you practice them separately, even then it becomes important for the practitioner and the students to understand what the philosophies are that sort of serve as the engines for the different practices, and then after that understanding is well understood then it's possible to start to get creative. And I think that one of the things that you're doing that's really interesting, that's it's it's sort of novel for the Qigong community because a lot of Qigong is very didactic in nature. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I see you doing with your sharing um, in social media and with the, the course offerings that you have is that there's a, almost a communicative strategy where you you're illustrating things in a way where it kind of feels like even though the viewer is in the role of the viewer it kind of feels almost like there's a two-way communication going on between you and the viewer and i'm wondering if you can um sort of summarize how you have achieved that ability to put these really kind of difficult to understand philosophical complex concepts in movement into a type of practice where people feel engaged with you when they watch your videos and they feel engaged with you when they, when they hear you speak about these things. <laughs> I wish that there was some formula or some kind of explanation I could give that illuminates that. But um, to be honest, the, the thing that drives anything that I do is, is this of benefit and support to anyone? <laughs> right. And and I just I I really uh, I, you know my my teachers have been so generous with me and the way that um, things have been shared and um, transmitted have radically helped me feel freer and more at ease and healthier and more loving and able to be available to those in my family and my community and my friends in a way that is also loving. So 
anything that I feel like can be communicated that engages people in a way that gets them interested um, and makes them feel that this also could be worthwhile, I'll just do. <laughs> um, you know, I think what's appealed to me in my teachers is their, their clarity and their ability to take complex ideas and translate them into language that a skeptical uncle or aunt or friend might accept. You know, I, I try to I, I try to teach in a way and share these things in a way that um, doesn't alienate but includes. And I feel that's really important these days because uh, there's a, enough polarity or uh, uh, pulling apart at the kind of center and into the, the you know the, the very fabric of our society sometimes feels like it's getting pulled apart. So uh, whatever can kind of make people feel that you know. There's something something in it, in it for me. Um, I remember my, my uh, <clears throat> you know one of my all of my teachers have always been people I feel offer teaching so that it's relevant to our to our <clears throat> our lives. Um, and you know I I know that you love studying the ancient texts. That's what drew me to a lot of these philosophies is reading like just the uh, almost transcendent quality sometimes of, of how people conceived of their world and, and, and the beauty of it and the, the possibility of um, a, a harmony in it. And we don't live in that, that ancient world, but you know, we can still draw some of the richness from those um, uh, paradigms and, and from those um, uh, longings and yearnings and see how they can relate to us today and how we might be able to find them useful. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I wish there were a formula, but I don't know what it is. Well, maybe the formula is just really respecting and appreciating people and wanting to help them in any way you can. Yeah. Yeah. If you start, if, if a person starts there, then at the very least, when they bring their intention to the table, uh, that's the intention. It's a pretty good one compared to some of the other intentions that you could have, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome. So then as a, as a teacher, um, when you have new students or intermediate students or advanced students, how do you sort of process the, the learning, or I, could, I guess I could say how you conceptualize the, the learning process of students, because one of our jobs here at, at Dawi is to try to understand the opinions of, of teachers who are working in the, I, you know, sometimes we don't like to use the word industry out loud, but um, who are working in this space um, to sort of get an idea of like, what is uh, the pedagogy of Qigong when it's taken into a context that's outside of its native context in China? And how do students, um, how do they thrive as Qigong students when you're translating cultural ideas from this, you know, this culture you're very, very intimate with, maybe to a culture that they're not from a, in a cultural context that they're not so intimate with? How do you like make them understand and make them thrive in this environment? To help people remember that, you know, whether it be Qigong or any of the Chinese arts, the reason to practice is to be happy and healthy. That's universal. It doesn't matter what culture you're from and what background or conditions you've been raised in. You know, I think that's just universal. Um, in terms of pedagogy, To have, so it's interesting because it, it, in China, there is often a, a very hierarchical vertical model of the teacher and then the disciples and the students. Um, and then that model is attempted to get, you know, to, 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 to cross into a Western um, way of 
educating and the uh, pedagogic model, but it tends to uh, kind of crumble and, and, and fray uh, because of individualism and de democratic values and whatnot, and everyone has an opinion and who, you know, who are you to have that power and authority, or it becomes a corrupted power and authority that, um, you know, creates a, a whole other bag of problems within kind of a, a, a very vertical learning environment, abuses of power and um, projections and counter projections. Um, my my Shifu in, in Beijing, he's quite modern, but he's also super old school. Like he didn't come up through the All China Martial Arts Federation. He met his Shifu in a village. He, he had some renown. And then he told me when I asked him, he said, it was just like in the movies. You know, he lived with them for three years and he cooked and cleaned and apprenticed and, you know, really did the, that old school way of, of learning. Um, but my Shifu also, uh, back in the mid 2000s, probably 2006, seven, long before there were, you know, ideas around, um, LGBTQ rights worldwide, he officiated a lesbian couple getting married. Um, and he has, he, he holds a lot of um, integrity and respect and he really transmits that. But he also, I, I knew he was my shuffle the first few minutes that I met him because he was so goofy. <laughs> He was, he just made me laugh. And he was, I was in stitches like half the time studying with him. And I think he bridges a little bit of this um, more horizontal pedagogic model with the more vertical. And for me, my pedagogic, pedagogic model feels very uncomfortable being vertical. I much more prefer a horizontal learning model where um, you know, if I'm doing trainings, for example, it's, I offer inquiry. So I'm not the one with answers. I might have experience. I might have suggestions. I might have a framework for the way things can be done and explored. Um, but the work should be done by the students and the exploration should be done by the students. And the inquiry is the way to continue to deepen the practice. So the way that I teach is often inquiry based rather than tell people how to feel. I say, how, you know, what's it like to move or breathe like this? Um, so it's very much about giving um, authority and empowerment back to the practitioner. Uh, and I think Shifu would really agree that that's, again, that, that's the, the important marker. But even before I met Shifu, all of my other teachers were also teaching in this way. And, and that's what's been always very comfortable for me. Um, it may feel uncomfortable for some students when I say, I don't know, you know, I don't have the answer or that I'm not spoon feeding a system, um, but rather offering a process for reflection and investigation and exploration, which in sort of, you know, this day and age, it, it, it can feel unsettling because people want a, a system, right? They want how to do this, why to do this, what's the reason. Um, and very often my, my response to things uh, will be, let's just see, or how does it feel? Or, um, you know, what's it like? And, you know, it could be like this, but ultimately, the mystery is what I'm interested in and the not knowing, you know, answers are dead ends and dull for me, but asking into and leaning into, um, you know, sort of the unknown and the vast and the, uh, the possibilities and the infinite endless possibilities of experience is far more interesting to me. I mean, Ultimately, the ultimate question is what happens after we die? Who knows, right? But that's not even the question that's interesting. It's more just my relationship to it that's more fascinating. And then to, to conclude here, 
my answer to this question started with happiness right? and just that these practices are here to help our health and happiness. Um, but I think it's also to recognize that um, we're just shifting spheres of energy. And there's no real sense of identity that I can really find like in the smallest atom of quark of my cells, like it's just empty space. And my physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, intentional energies are just moving. So the most important thing for me is not to take myself too seriously. <laughs> you know, I'll do my best to transmit teachings because I think they'll be of benefit to people. But, uh, you know, the Tao says beautifully, do your work, then step back. Right? And that's, that's what frees us. That's serenity. That's fantastic. And uh, I think that one of the things that really jumped out to me was that um, one of your sort of consistent statements is that you're establishing uh, a relationship which is not vertical and is more horizontal. And to me personally, it seems like one of the major challenges uh, especially of Qigong, because we're dealing with things that are psycho psychological and have a somatic element to them uh, at the same time, where both need to be emphasized, that you can get trends, as you say. One trend is toward this very vertical relationship with the teacher where they're, they're a master, and maybe yeah. they even call themselves master, which personally I'm not that fond of. But yeah. uh, on, on the other hand, there's also a very strong movement toward sort of an absolute atomized, individualized approach to practice, which I don't see that many teachers doing, but I see a lot of students doing, where it may be some things get left behind because there's a community of energy that occurs between the between all of the students and the teacher and the, the elders and the next generation that you kind of miss if you get atomized in practice and just think about my little bundle of energy, right? And so when you say that you like to teach in a horizontal fashion, kind of opens the idea that maybe there's even, uh, like you share an energy with the people. Um, and then when you talked about the idea of going down and looking at yourself in the smallest possible sense at the atomic level, you don't see self there you see this this unit of energy that's flowing with the rest of the energy so there's a really beautiful philosophy behind that and i just want to know and i want i want to know on behalf of the, the listeners too how'd you figure that out because like <laughs> we, got, we got we we got to figure that out too so i don't know interested to know well so, um I didn't know if I figured anything out. I think it's just kind of a felt feeling into things moment to moment. Um, and before we uh, started this and we were just chatting, I was saying that the early Taoists in, in the Han Dynasty took vows or precepts when they, um, they, they sort of got inspired by the Buddhists who had their eight precepts and then they came up with their own and they had different levels of them. But one of them was, um, if you ever get into an argument, be the first to concede. Uh, and the other one, there's nine of them, but you know some of them are un, sort of predictable, like you know, don't harm others if you don't need to and whatnot. But um, do not seek fame or glory. Uh, but then the other one was, it, um, do not hold strong views and opinions. And I, I feel like the, those are very hard for a lot of people to think about as a promise that you'd make for life. <laughs> um, but they're very attractive to me um, because it keeps things very open and fluid. And, you know, Sima Qian, who you probably know is the early Chinese Han Dynasty historian, he described and defined, he was the first one to define Taoism. Um, but uh, he said, and part of his definition, you know, it is nowhere, um, nowhere unapplicable Right. And it changes with the times. And that's beautiful because, you know, it, it, I think the, particularly the thing about 
Taoism and therefore the branches of practice that have spun out from that, including Qigong and many of the other internal and energy arts, um, is that it, it, there, there's a, a, an invitation for it to um, always be relevant and always be changing. And the moment that um, sort of a more dogmatic or fixed opinion arises, which it very naturally does in a human mind, um, you know, the invitation for me there is to, to soften around that uh, because we don't know. <laughs> yeah, and um, I think it's just very important to keep the, 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 the inquiry process alive and to respect Therefore, this um, cornerstone of Taoism as well, of uh, changing with the times, of being nowhere in, in a, unapplicable. Um, and, you know, the, the, the core also of, or the, the key kind of philosophy underpinning Taoism of um, when you meet resistance, don't push, right? You, 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 uh, you soften, you yield, right? effort without struggle and strife will wait. And um, how, do, how does one arrive at that? I think it's Yuan Fin. <laughs> it's just, you know, <laughs> fortune. <laughs> um, but uh, having, you know, for me, it's really humbling, trying to humble myself to the wisdom of the teachings. Um, and to my teachers who have experience in things that I don't, um, and to continually, you know, be open to learning from them. Excellent. So look how much territory we've covered. We have, we've met you, we've learned about Leo Stel Bagua, which is really cool. We have talked about yoga, we've talked about qigong, we talked about philosophical concepts, we found out that you have a really, really nice heart. And I'm so happy that you gave me the chance to do this interview. Um, as we wind it down, there's two things that we customarily do here. The first one is to ask you, where do you see qigong going in the next 10 years? And I'm going to qualify that and say, in the occidental sense, mm. since you're teaching in the occident mostly. Mm -hmm. mm, I, I think it's such a beautiful antidote to the, the pressurized uh, activities of life. And I'm, I'm wary even to use the word busy. Uh, as you know, maybe the, the word mang in Chinese is the radical for the heart and the radical for wang, which means death, right? So to be busy is heart death. Um, but it's such an antidote to, to uh, the striving and the effort and the struggle. And um, there's such a, an immediate uh, nourishment from connecting to nature as nature is struggling. Uh, so I think that there's a beautiful space opening up for a practice like Qigong that is um, you know, very nature-based, very uh, supportive of one's more um, energetic states that can, you know, build a, a more harmonious and uh, integrated sense of well-being and wellness. Um, so I'm I'm excited for the future of Qigong in the next ten years. Excellent. And then one last thing is, um, can you please tell us about? the projects that you're doing that you would like our audience to be able to access? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a few different platforms that I offer online courses with, which may be more accessible depending on where you live. Uh, I'm planning to do some work um, with uh, an organization called Commune. They're based in the U.S., and I've done some filming and courses for them. And, um, and I'm really grateful that it seems people have benefited a lot from them. And I'm planning to film some more. And then a new one on the eight, a new course, five day course uh, will be available in the beginning of the year uh, on the Shibashi, Qigong Taiji Shibashi, the 18 forms. 
Um, and, you know, you, people are just welcome to check out what appeals to them on my website. Um, I offer uh, weekly classes that will start up in September again, uh, different um, courses and trainings. So, yeah, you're welcome to uh, take part in what might um, seem appealing. Great. So we'll make sure that the appropriate links go into the description of the of the video. Um, thank you very much. This has been really wonderful. Um, I have learned a lot, and I'm sure that our audience also has, will will learn a lot at the time of uh, seeing and listening. So um, please stay for just a moment uh, after we turn off the recording. And um, for everybody in the audience, um, you know what to do. Mimi Guo Dimer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robbie. It's really, yeah. And thank you, everybody who's taken some time to listen. <laughs>